Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. So wonderful to see you all. If you have wondered why uh, you, your, your seat has been blanketed with a flyer, that is for you to take with you to give you someone to invite to Easter next week. So uh, grab one, grab two, grab, you know, a few. Uh, but let's stand as we worship together. Sing it out. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's face. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood that God saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. The chains of my past are broken at last. I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? goodness. I've tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross and God saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm
got a hold of me. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. I hope that you've had a good week, and even if you hadn't, that I'm glad you're here. You're in a place where you can be encouraged and helped. As Brennan mentioned, all the paper on the, you know, I heard someone say, is somebody sitting here? Uh, all the seats are not saved. Uh, uh, they will be after the service, hopefully. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but take one, as many as you want. When we leave, we're going to reload it after it's over, and we wanted to give you something. It helps me to go visit people and invite them to church if I have something to hand to them. And used to, I never did anything as far as reaching out on Easter because it's like, that's a slam dunk anyway. Everybody shows up anyway. But really, if you uh, know somebody that you could invite, this is the perfect time to invite them to come. And as your pastor, I assure you, nobody's going to say anything about, ah, oh, you people just come on Easter and Christmas. We're not doing that. We're just celebrating Jesus. And we want to have as many friends and family to be here as can possibly do that. Also, I want to give a word of explanation before we greet each other. I'm not having a midlife crisis and starting to grow a beard to try to feel better about myself. Uh, I decided I, I quit shaving last Sunday. I'm going to do a monologue on Wednesday as a Roman centurion, and I thought I could grow enough beard out to do for that. I think it's going to work. And I, I have absolutely no concern about what you think. When it, when it comes to facial hair, Nancy has the trump card on everything, so i uh, just say it. So, uh, but I'm glad you like it, Brennan. It looks kind of like you uh, in 60 years. Um, yeah, so let's take a moment, greet those near you. Thanks so much for being here today.
This Sunday is Palm Sunday, but we looked at Palm Sunday last Sunday. So this Sunday, we're going to look at Black Friday, even though uh, uh, someone pointed out to me it's not Black Friday, it's Good Friday. I said, okay, I run into more trouble with this little short sermon series about the Passion Week than I have in anything I've ever done before. Uh, but I admit that it is kind of confusing because on Wednesday we're going to look at we're going to have Good Friday on Wednesday, which is confusing also. But it'll be more simple next year. I chose Black Friday. The reason I called Black Friday, as far as the time of the crucifixion, is because um, for Jesus it was a dark, dark day. Uh, the sun actually quit shining at noon and didn't shine till three o'clock, so that's dark. Uh, Jesus, when he talked to Judas to go and do what he was supposed to do to betray him, he said, this is your hour uh, in which darkness reigns. And so that's why I call it Black Friday, is just because of the presence of evil and the, the, all the things that went on uh, on this Friday uh, when Jesus lays down his life. We're in Mark chapter 15. I want to re begin reading at verse 21 and read through verse 41, a rather lengthy text, but the the more I read of the Word of God, then I won't have to explain as many things. And so uh, this is just the documentation of what happened 
uh, between when Jesus is taken to the cross and when Jesus dies on the cross. He has already been scourged, uh, 39 lashes with the cat of nine tails, uh, bled a lot. Uh, and now we pick up the story in verse 21. And it says, And they compelled a passerby, uh, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Uh, the one being crucified would have been surrounded by four Roman soldiers, kind of like a box, two in the front, two in the back. Uh, one of those in the front would have been carrying the placard, the board that lists the charge against Jesus was King of the Jews. Uh, and then uh, they were to carry the cross beam, weighed about 100 pounds. Uh, he was so weak from blood loss and the exhaustion, he was not able to carry it. He tried, but he wasn't able to, so they get Simon to carry it. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. It was a type of sedative that the women provided when they, I guess, the mercy in the midst of the cruelty of the crucifixion that was always available when the Romans crucified in the Jerusalem area. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. That'd be nine in the morning. Uh, Roman time, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, ha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, uh, that was noon, uh, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with some sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that it was that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly as this man was a the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Jesus allowed himself to be crucified. Jesus was willing to be crucified uh, so that we might uh, be saved. Uh, from our sins and spend eternity with God. Uh, this, cro this pulpit that I use is over 39 years old. Uh, my dad made it for me at my request. I gave him a little picture I'd seen of a cross, and then I was amazed he was able to have a pulpit like this. He built it, delivered it in February of 1984 uh, to the Harmony Baptist Church. It's matched every all three of the churches where I've pastored, and I've always used it. Uh, I like it because it's mobile. It's not really heavy. You can move it around. Uh, some churches have pulpits that are about the size of a cockpit on a 747, and it takes a lot of effort if you ever want to move it, so it's portable. But the main reason that I like it and that I requested it is because it's in the shape of a cross. That from the very beginning, not only of when I began to preach, but when I began to follow Jesus, the main thing that has motivated me is the, the cross of Jesus Christ that we glory in the cross, that we are thankful that it's through the cross that our sins have been paid for, uh, that it's through the cross alone that we have a relationship with God. And I don't care how smart you get or how far along in your Christian journey you get, you never get past the point of the reality that if we're going to glorify in anything, we're going to glor glorify in the cross. And so as we look at this morning, uh, the uh, Black Friday, I want to I mention three Lingering consequences of Christ's crucifixion. Three consequences uh, that are still true today. And why it really is Good Friday instead of Black Friday, I, I'll give that to you. First of all, Jesus paid our debt. Jesus paid our debt. Um, he gives us, it says that he makes a loud cry at the end of his 
time on the cross, and he yells something. And uh, when he does so, uh, what he says is uh, one word, tetelestai. In the original language, it means paid in full. Uh, It was a term that was used in the marketplace that if you paid a bill, they would write tetelestai on it. They didn't give you a confirmation number like they do today. I, I hate that. When I'm on the you know, I'm on my iPad, and then they're going to give me a confirmation number that this is actually going to. And it's just, I'm to the point now. I don't even write it down. Uh, just, to, but anyway. But back then, when you had a bill and you wrote tetelestai on it, it meant it's paid in full. So you had proof that you had paid your bill. When Jesus cries out and says, and says, "It is finished," it means it is paid in full. Uh, he paid a real debt uh, on the cross uh, when he died there for us. Jesus paid our debt. He did so in full. The word that he uses here that means it's paid in full means exactly that. That his death on the cross paid for the sins of all the world to that time and since that time every sin you've ever committed, every sin you ever will commit, that it was paid for by Jesus on the cross. Um, The death of Christ on the cross potentially pays for the sins of everybody who's ever been created in the history of the world. It actually pays only for those who believe. And so that's a a reality that it was paid in full. That means that you cannot add anything to or take anything away from what Jesus completed on the cross. And you you need to get that situated in your head. Because otherwise, you're going to, even though you'd be saved by grace, you're going to be trying to live a life of works where you try to try to make yourself acceptable to God by what you do or what you don't do or whatever. Once you're in Christ, He paid in full on the cross for your sin, and it's paid for completely. That's that's the only reason that we are acceptable to God. We don't add our good works to that. We don't by our bad works and our failures and our sins take away from what Christ did. We are accepted in Christ. By God. So Jesus paid our debt uh, on that Friday when he died on the cross. He paid for our debt in full. Making God accessible. Uh, It says in verse 38 that the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. In the temple in Jerusalem, there was a place called the Holy of Holies uh, at the, the far end of the temple. It was behind a huge curtain, almost as tall as this is. And a foot thick is just huge. And that was where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the presence of God uh, was there. It had the mercy seat on the top of it. Uh, the high priest would go in once a year and take the blood of a sacrifice and pour that on the mercy seat. It was on the top of the Ark of the Covenant for the sins of the people. Uh, they had it down to the point that uh, when the chief priest goes in there, they tied a rope around his ankle so if he had some kind of sin in his life and he was not acceptable to God and God struck him dead, they could get him out of there without somebody else having to go in there that wasn't qualified. So this is a really big deal that God's presence, because of sin, he was separated from his people. He, had, he dwelt there, there a sacrifice once a year, sin is satisfied one more year. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, it was torn from top to bottom. It was like God himself reaches down, tears the curtain apart, and says, you can now come and have fellowship with me. This was the intent all along, but there had to be a permanent sacrifice made, and Jesus made that sacrifice, making God accessible. You aren't able to approach God because you've become a better person or because you've tried harder or because of your pedigree. It's only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So Jesus paid our debt. And that continues to be reality, reality even to today. And that's why a lingering consequence, a reality caused by the death of Jesus on the cross, he paid our debt. Secondly, he captured our hearts. Jesus captured our hearts. We follow Jesus not because we're afraid he's going to get us if we don't do the right thing. Now, some of you may be motivated by that. But once you get to know Christ and you're aware of what he did for you on the cross, what motivates you, what keeps you faithfully following him is gratitude for what he's already done for you. That I'm thankful 
that he died in my place on the cross and it's love for him that motivates me. He's captured my heart by what he did for me 2,000 years ago before I even became a human being, before I existed. He has already died in my place and that captures my heart so that what I do, I do because I love him and I'm grateful to him and that's the motivation that I have for doing that. He captured our hearts by enduring pain. He experienced physical pain. Uh, we know that he had a crown of thorns driven into his head. He had spikes driven through his wrists and his feet. He was beaten uh, within an inch of his life by the scourging. Um, and the pain he endured causes us to love him that he did that on our behalf. Uh, decades ago, when the Passion of the Christ came out, my son was in college. He and his roommate had gone to see it. And when I was talking to Jason about that, I said, so what did Brandon say? And he said, we did not speak. We still haven't said a word about it. And so I thought, well, that's kind of odd. Nancy and I went with some friends to go see it out here. Same thing happened. That it's such a, it was such a portrayal, realistically, of what actually happened when Jesus was crucified, when he was scourged, that it was so emotional and so overwhelming that when the movie was over, we got up and walked out and nobody said a word. It was just that powerful. And, and not the movie, but the re realization of what Jesus did by enduring physical pain, capturing our hearts because he endured that pain on our behalf. Um, and also there's spiritual pain in verse 34 when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I agree with those who say that that was the time when Jesus takes upon himself the sins of the world and God in his holiness cannot look upon sin. And there's this sense that Jesus has of like being a lost person, that he is in sin and he's separated from God. And there's this spiritual pain that he endured on our behalf because that's the only way we could be saved. And so he, he endured pain and his enduring of that pain physical and spiritual pain captures our hearts because of our gratitude for it. Not only by enduring pain, but also uh, by resisting revenge. He resisted revenge. The cross was not way up there, uh, like a lot of times it's portrayed when we see it. The cross was a little above eye level because they didn't want to have to, it'd be real hard to maneuver everything if you had them way up high. So they're not... They would be elevated, but not that much. So as soon as Jesus is, the cross is dropped into the hole and he's there, then you have all these people making fun of him. The crowd, uh, the, the words that are used here, the, the crowd, the religious leaders, even the other criminals who are there, it says they derided him, they mocked him, they reviled him, they wagged their heads. You know, they're just, they're just, they're in their element, man. They're, they're, you know, come on down, I'll get you some, you know, whatever, all this stuff. And they just on and on. And he chose to stay there. Now, he could have come down. Uh, one, when I lived in Holdenville, and I, it wasn't the same dogs, but I had dogs, and I walked every day. And we had to walk by. I've tried to get around it, but there's just no way that I could get home without walking by this one house where a, it was a guy that he had some mental issues. Uh, but he also had three huge dogs that were on log chains. And... Um, They'd always, it was the same thing every day. We'd walk by and then they'd run and hit the end of those chains and then fall back and we'd just keep going home. Well, one day, uh, the Rottweiler hits the end of the chain and his collar came loose and here he comes. Let me just say that changed the entire situation immediately. And he comes loping across the yard and it, I, I still don't know how we kind of got out of that, but anyway, it, it changed it. It would have changed the situation entirely if all those people are reviling Jesus and deriding him and wagging, and then he just said, yeah, okay, and he just, he, he jumps down off the cross, and uh, he takes names later, but he didn't do that. There had to be, he was entirely human, so there's a part of him that would want to be, I can do this, I'm going to, you know, but he resisted revenge. He stayed there because he chose to do that. That's the only way that our sins can be paid for. And so 
He captured our hearts by enduring pain, by resisting revenge, by finishing strong. It, Roman, it says the Roman centurion who was there said, truly this was the Son of God after he saw how he died. Because Jesus, usually when somebody died on the cross, they became weaker and weaker, and they, after they had cussed all they could cuss and yelled all they could yell, then they eventually get, they just die. Jesus chooses to die, and he cries out and says, it is finished. He commits his spirit into the hands of God, and then he dies. He finished strong. He didn't get halfway done and then quit. He didn't almost pay for the sins of the world. He finished strong and declared his victory, and then he died. That captures our hearts. That he didn't just say, I'm, I feel for you, but I can't reach you. He didn't say, well, I'm going to start, but I'm not going to finish. He, he came for the express purpose of paying for the sins of the world. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And he realized that from the very beginning. And therefore, he set his face towards Jerusalem. He has a purpose in mind. And he finished strong and completed the task for which he came to the earth. And that captures our hearts. You may be here this morning, and the reason you are here is because you're afraid God's going to get you if you don't come to church or something like that. Well, I'm still glad you're here. But I want to remind you that God loves you, and that's why he sent his son, and Jesus endured pain, and he resisted revenge, and he finished strong. And by what he did for you, that should make you where you're willing, that I'm going to live for the one who died for me. That I'm going to do what he asked me to do. And I'm motivated. That's why Christians can't be deterred. That's why we're going to remain faithful till the time that Jesus comes back. It's not because of somebody driving us with a whip. But because of the fact that the salvation of God is, of Jesus is real. And as a result of that salvation we are moving forward. And we're not, not ever going to quit living for Jesus because he died for me. Jesus paid our debt, Jesus captured our hearts, and then finally, Jesus earned our trust. Trust is earned. I don't know if you figured that out yet or not. Uh, you earn trust over time by the actions that you take. When it comes to relationships, forgiveness is immediate and it's permanent. I mean, you, you do that, but trust is something that you earn over time. And anybody who demands trust but is not willing to earn it probably doesn't need to have it. Jesus, by his actions, earns our trust so that I can trust him. I can trust him, first of all, that he will take us to heaven. That he will take us to heaven. One of the criminals, it says, both of these criminals uh, also reviled him. When the, I mean, think of the absurdity of that. They're being crucified also. They're dying. They're on their last leg, but they yielded to peer pressure. I mean, all the, everybody else on the ground is saying stuff, and they're, well, let's just join in too. What a knucklehead. I mean, just to do that. Talk about, I'll just say this while I'm in the neighborhood. There's peer pressure everywhere you go for all of your life, and you need to learn how to be an overcomer instead of a victim. Just overcome it. So they didn't overcome it. They're reviling him. They're doing all this. Well, in a parallel account in the gospel, we know that one of the criminals, about 12 o'clock, just before it gets dark, he says, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus responds, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Okay. This guy does not pray the sinner's prayer. He isn't baptized. Uh, he doesn't know all there is to know about the purpose of Jesus coming and dying, and he doesn't even know that the resurrection is going to take place. He doesn't know all that. All he asks for is basically, have mercy on me. And Jesus didn't say, well, what have you been saying the last three hours? What do you mean asking for? This is your ultimate deathbed confession right here, or deathbed salvation, that and yet Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That means I can trust him that he's going to take me to heaven. 
if I have asked him to forgive me and ask him to be my savior. Now, I did that a long time ago. Many of you did that a long time ago. Some of you did that recently. But we can trust him that if he allows the criminal who's been reviling him earlier and making fun of him earlier, and when this guy just says, would you let me in? Jesus says, yes, today you'll be with me. He gives him the golden ticket. He lets him in. That means I can trust Jesus to take me to heaven when I die. Even if I can't remember all the words that I prayed when I asked him to be my savior, even if maybe I didn't have the best of motives when that happened, even if, I, if I'm trusting in him, he is able and he will take me to heaven because it's not about my works, it's about his grace. And so I can live with the confidence that whatever happens in life, I know that when it's over, he's going to take me to heaven because he has earned my trust by his death on the cross and by what he did on that day. I can trust him to take me to heaven. Also, that he will represent us to God. I just finished reading the book of Hebrews again. Actually, I lacked one more chapter. I didn't quite have enough time this morning. Um, the whole book emphasizes how Jesus is our great high priest and after his death and his shed blood, that he represents us to God, that he is our intercessor, that he... Rela and used to, uh, I would think about... Actually, this has been a long time ago. But some people think like this as far as him interceding for us before God. It's like he's up there begging and saying, I know Earl's messing up, but please don't hold that again. That isn't what he's doing. His, after he completed his payment for our sins on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and I... He's just there, and God is aware. There's scars on the wrist of Jesus. It's a constant awareness that our, the price for our sin has been paid for. He represents, I can trust him to represent me to God. I can trust him to represent you to God. If you've accepted him as Savior, then he, he's representing us to God. We are not accepted because of what we have done. We are accepted because what Jesus has finished. And so he earned our trust that he will not only take us to heaven, but he will represent us to God. And then also that he will empower us to live. When that curtain was torn in two, the opening was not just for us to have access to God. The opening was also that God now is with his people, that he is with us, that he's not confined to some area, that he's not just limited to in the Holy of Holies, but now he is out with us. And he will empower us to live. Uh, that in our weakness, he becomes our strength. That we are never alone. That he is with us wherever we go. That he empowers us. That he lives and he chooses to be with us and for us at all times. And he will empower us to live. And I can trust him. So, so Good Friday, in the sense that Jesus has, has made possible that he... He paid our debt. He captured our hearts so that we serve him because we love him. And he earned our trust, that I can live with trust and confidence that he's going to take me to heaven. He's going to represent me to God always. And that he's going to empower me to live so that even though I don't know what the world holds, I don't know how everything, whatever's going to happen is going to happen, that he's going to empower me because he is out with me and for me in the presence of the Holy Spirit, empowering me to do everything that he asked me to do. And so that's why it's Good Friday. And that's why what Jesus accomplished on the cross uh, for ever uh, for his people. Decades ago, I, I preached a sermon. I used, to, I used to be more creative than I am now. Uh, Seemed like a week lasted a lot longer than it does now. Um, but uh, I came up with this idea, and I preached this sermon at uh, the church in Atoka where I was a pastor. I brought in a full-size cross. So I had a friend who ran a lumber mill, so that, that was possible, and carried in this cross. And I still remember my first line was, they don't make crosses like they used to. And then I said something about, we wear them as necklaces. We will, you know, carry them in your pocket. Have little decorative things, which I have a lot of myself. But I held up this cross and I said, "This is what a real cross looks like." And, uh, and then I said, "But it needs to be adjusted." 
And I laid it down on the stage. And I said, if this was the cross on which Jesus died, and then I talked about the crown of thorns, and I attached the crown of thorns to it. I put the sign up there that said King of the Jews, and nailed it on there, and said that, you know, different things. And then I drove spikes where his uh, arms would have been, or his wrists would have been, and where his feet were. And then I, at the end, I said, now there's this one thing, one more thing. There would have been blood. And I'd made up this concoction of paint and lick whatever, and I put blood where his back would have been, where his, the nails were, or the spikes. And then I stood it up. And I said, there's the cross. And you could have heard a pin drop. See, even like now, y'all aren't saying, I mean, just thinking about it. It's overwhelming. It's emotional. And I, I did that a few other places. I even went to the BC, BCM at OSU and did that. Um, and it had the same effect everywhere I went. It's just like every, everybody's dumbfounded to think in reality. You know, it's one thing, and I've got one, it's one thing to wear a cross around my neck. It's another thing to look at an old rugged cross and to think about what Jesus did. And I think that, I th that goes back Jesus in John chapter 12, he told the apostles, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. And he really was lifted up on the cross. And then we continue to lift him up as we declare him as the crucified Savior of the world. I pray God's drawing you to himself just by the thought of what Jesus did for you. Our mission as a church, our mission as Christians is to make much of Jesus and to lift him up. I was talking to someone yesterday and I just said, there's so much evil and so much wrong in the world now, I don't even know where to start. I mean, do you, where, where, where did, how did we get here? How do we get out of this? And then the, the person I was talking to said, you just keep reminding them of the same thing you've been reminding them of forever. We're going to lift Jesus up. Anyone who comes to him is forgiven and changed from the inside out. And the world's going to be changed uh, when people surrender to Jesus as Lord. And they're not going to surrender to Jesus as Lord when we get smarter and smarter. Uh, they're going to surrender to Jesus as Lord when we live for the one who died for us. Let's stand for prayer. Two words come to mind, Jesus. Thank you. We are grateful uh, for the price you paid for us. And we pray that you would use the reality of what you've done uh, to draw other people to yourself. Thank you that you are powerful and you are kind, that your desire is not to keep everybody out of heaven. Your desire is to that none perish but all come to a saving knowledge of you. That's why you came. So help us to keep sharing the good news. I pray for all of us this morning, uh, one who's here, who's never done like the criminal on the cross and ask you to forgive them, that this would be the day when they say that. To some who maybe have strayed from you as far as how they're living, that they'd realize after all that you've done for them, they'd, they'd want to live for you. Draw them back unto yourself. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be here at the front if I can help you in any way as we sing our final song.
Good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We wanted to not only recognize, but celebrate all the baptisms that have happened over the month of March. In speaking of baptism, we have a great opportunity on Easter Sunday for people to be baptized. So if you would like for that to be you, please contact one of the church staff members. Then this Wednesday at the gathering, it is Good Friday on Wednesday. So Earl will be doing a dramatic monologue over the Roman centurion. And we will also be partaking in the Lord's Supper. So we'd love for you guys to come and worship with us this Wednesday at 630. And in a couple of Sundays, it is Big Serve Sunday. That's on April 23rd. And so to kick off this Sunday, we are having a missions meal immediately following the second service in the FLC. This will be to help raise support for all the students going on mission trips this summer. Then in the afternoon, the youth will be serving the community. And so if you have a project that the youth could do at your house, please contact Seth. And also contact Seth if you're interested in volunteering with the youth. We would love for people to help drive the youth students around and to serve right along next to them. And finally, before you go, remember, abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build his church, and go and make disciples. Have a great week. You're dismissed.